Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York. He represents the state's 5th Congressional District located in Queens, New York. Importantly, he is the top Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman, it's great to see you. Thank you for being with us. Um, we were just talking in the commercial break about the conversation I was just having with, with Zippy Livni, a former very senior Israeli politician, a former vice pre prime minister of Israel, someone who might one day be a prime minister of Israel. And we were trying to, it's, it's really hard in this moment to get to the conversation of next, right? The conversation of how does this look for peace for Israelis and for Palestinians? When I was on the ground in Israel, Israelis were telling me this. We need this to end in a way that doesn't have me back there in five years reporting on the same thing or in 10 years. And yet that does seem to be how it goes. Yeah, and I found the same thing. When I visit Israel, I talk to Israelis and I go and I talk to Palestinians. They all want peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the, what we've got to talk about, clearly you can't do that with Hamas. Hamas is there for one reason. They want the destruction of Israel. So it's hard to talk to someone when they want your destruction. But if you look at the region, you know, we've got to get others involved. Diplomacy is always best when there's multiple people involved. And I think an example is uh, when you look at Egypt and Jordan. There was once upon a time with them where the war, the main wars, was, was the Israelis and Egypt. But then they came to a time to say Egypt said Israel has the right to exist. Jordan says Israel has the right to exist. And then there can be dialogue and conversation on how we can get peace that then can ease some of the tension. And we need some of the other countries in the region to say, and what I look at now, when you look at Gaza as it is, once you get rid of Hamas, it has to be rebuilt. And that there, thereby it needs to have, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Bahrain, whether it's the UAE, all of them involved, so that now there's investment that's going into it so that these children, I visited a lot of young kids uh, when I was in Palestine the last time, but on the West Bank, and all they wanted to do was get their education and be able to live in peace, but the same as on the other side. But when you get these tensions as you have with Hamas and folks saying Israel has no right to exist, then it's hard to have peace. And I think that's the direction that we have to move in, and that's diplomacy. And the United States has to be engaged in trying to bring those sides together. That's one of the reasons why I have been a big proponent of the so-called Abraham Accords, because it gets others to say Israel has the right to exist, and the conversation about how do we help uh, invest and create a better life for the Palestinians. So the problem is, the problem with the Abraham Accords is there were no Palestinians involved, right? So you, 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 you laid out something very interesting about how this could end, but there's no Palestinian voice. And the argument is if you can't talk to Hamas, this is the conversation I was just having with Zippy Livni, to whom do you talk that actually involves the people who are being governed? So, Ian, uh, you know, and you're right, uh, even with, the, uh, with Abbas, he's kind of a weak leader. But here's why you have to have others. Because what I see is all of these proxies and others that are playing, uh, playing uh, in, in the region. And if they all say, because they all talk about the Palestinians also. Correct. They Everybody have, in the region talks, but, talks about the but, a big, a big game about the Palestinians. Palestinians. But nobody does. Right. So that's why you got to get them in the game right. and making sure that they are talking about the Palestinians and let them help decide, you know, to bring the Palestinians in. But you remember, because you remember very well the Iraq war. Yes. Right? You remember that sometimes America goes in and says we can rebuild and we can build civil society and we can build infrastructure. We can do these things and maybe we can do that with partners. But in the end, unless there is someone credible for the people to believe in and to follow, we are going to have to directly address the problem of Palestinians who feel like they live under the thumb of somebody. That, that, is, that is correct, and that has been the case, you know, how we started this before. The Brits, you know, were the colonial power in the, in the Palestine at the time. And so you need to make sure that they are involved, but you also have to have, and it can't be just America. And that's why I think others uh, in the region are critically important, and thereby a large portion of what goes in to invest does not necessarily come from America, who is, a, you, know, you know, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Jews, we have everybody, but those regions have to be involved and invested also. And then it is a multiplier, because when I talk to the people of, the Pal of Palestine, what, you know, what the, the only thing that cannot happen and as they see it, as I talk to them, and that's the big question that we do have to cross, is the right of return. Right. Because that is the issue. Right. Because many this of is them, very important, because correct. many of them f trace back to 1948. That's correct. Being removed from their homes and their land. 
Israel guarantees a right of return to anyone who can demonstrate that they are Jewish. That does not exist for anybody who descends of anybody who was expelled from Palestine. That is correct. And that's the major problem that with the Palestinians, when you talk to, I mean, on the Hill this week, I was walking across the street and a Palestinian woman came up to me, uh, warning and begging for some uh, ceasefire, et cetera. And I said, well, we're working. I want a, a you know, ceasefire only, though, when Hamas stops sending rockets over also. Uh, and then I said, well, how do we get to peace? And then she tells me about the land that her parents and her family had, and she wants that back. Right. Now, that you know, is not, in my estimation, going to happen. And so we've got to realize and try to figure out how do we get past that. I think that's the largest stumbling block that we have with the Palestinians itself and the question of right of return. Because if you do that, then you're eliminating a Jewish state. Uh, and so, and you know, when you look at the Jewish people who have been pushed around, uh, you know, around the continent, all oh, over yeah, the it's place. easy to see. It's easy it's, to empathize with absolutely. everybody, but you got to read a couple pamphlets or books to. But that's right. To, to, to get it done, and I worry that we're not doing that. I agree with you on that. All right, stand by because none of this is getting done. Even if it's not America's role, it's not getting done without American support or input, and we got a bit of a problem with that uh, with Congress. So, uh, Representative Gregory Meeks is staying with me. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back be because he's the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and I could talk to him about the Middle East for a long time, but we actually have to talk a little bit about the chaos in Congress, which couldn't come at a less convenient time. The House of Representatives ought to have plenty on its legislative agenda, but instead it's entering its 19th day without a House speaker, and there's no clear indication of who the next speaker will be. Still with me in studio, New York Congressman Gregory Meeks, the top Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm out of adjectives about what to say about the the House. There is, that was one thing when the Republicans were sort of uh, flirting with, you know, ab the, the being anti-democratic. But this is just dysfunctional. This is just rules and basic stuff. This is not even about ideology and politics. This is unbelievable. Never in the history of the country have we had this kind of madness uh, where we cannot have a functioning House of Representatives. Uh, look, we, for, for the last 17, 18 days, Leader Jeffries and the Democrats have been saying, let's find a bipartisan way forward. Let's open the government. Not a lot of demands or anything of that nature, some basic things. Let's make sure that we are able to vote on the supplemental that the president has put forward. Let's make sure that we have a baseline that was agreed upon by both of us doing the debt ceiling so that we know what the dollars are, so that we can do the kinds of things that we need this to do. This is the basic America. function of government. This that's is not, not, that's, that's it. not high end. That's stuff. all we're talking about. It's not high end. And we said that we will be ready to work for it and to do those things. Uh, and it seemed as though we were. Uh, would have cooperated and worked with McHenry if he had to be there as Speaker Pro Tem for a longer period of time, just long as right. we open up the government. Yeah. November 17th is right around the corner. We know it will be devastating to all Americans, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Independent, if, in fact, government shuts down. So um, they have chosen, the Republicans have chosen, primarily led by the MAGA Republicans, that they want nothing to do with Democrats, and if Democrats are involved in it, they're going to try to make sure they stop whatever that agreement is. So whatever That's you and Jeffries and, 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 and you think should happen, you all have to bite your tongue a little bit and just say, that, that, you, all, you sort this problem out. That's right. So now it's just them and their civil war. And their civil war is like, you know, it, it, I got to put it this way, it's like gangs. They got these little gangs that are fighting among one another within the Republican Party, and they're fighting for their own turf and here and there. And so how do you, you know, resolve these differences between the gangs and the civil war that the Republicans are having among themselves? At this point, you know, it is who knows? I mean, maybe <laughs> we should go, and I think, you know, the Jordan race, when it was both public and private, Maybe they should just have... Very interesting, right? Um, In public, Jordan had a lot more support correct. than when they went to a uh, secret ballot. That is correct. So and maybe they just have se secret ballots, and maybe that way they can come up to some kind of decision uh, that, uh, that of who the speaker is. Because I think that a large part, and this is why Jordan was uh, dangerous, it is hard to have someone who's the speaker, who represents, you know, he's the third in line uh, to the presidency. Yeah where that person was part of the insurrection mm -hmm. trying to overturn the government of the United States of America. In actually, a moment. The presidency, yeah. 
where that ship to the rest of the, the world. world. And That's they're exactly like, guys, why don't you, you know, <laughs> Congressman, great to see you. We could have a long conversation. Hope you come back, as always. Uh, Democratic Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York. And that does it for me. Thank you for watching. You can catch me back here next weekend from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, you know what? You're going to catch somebody here next weekend. I actually am going on a planned vacation. So, uh, uh, but. but